This is the last learning unit for physio. We'll be thinking about reproductive systems, specifically the production of gametes and hormonal regulation of that process. Um, the last lecture that will be posted on Sunday, so the last material that we'll be covering this semester, will about, be about inheritance, so thinking about the genetic material within gametes and interactions between different genes, so thinking about um, autosomal uh, conditions, sex linkage, um, uh, getting a little bit into codominance and incomplete dominance and pedigree. So we'll be thinking more about genetic material within inheritance. We're going to touch on that at the very end of this lecture too to transition into that. Um, just in terms of kind of planning ahead, so like I mentioned, this is the last learning unit we're covering. So by this Sunday, uh, you'll have all the material that you need for the final. Um, the study guide for the final will be posted by November 20th, and remember that there's going to be material from the previous two lecture exams. So that study guide will include an indication of which most missed questions will be on there. Um, if you look on Canvas, the modules where we actually took exams, uh, you'll find those most missed question resources, as well as uh, for lecture exam two, there was a lot of challenges with the um, uh, action potential question on the last page, the essay question, so there's some uh, answers for that as well. Um, but on the study guide that will be posted on November 20th, it will give an indication of what to focus on from previous exams, and it will also provide the normal study guide information for the most recent set of material. So that would be covering muscular physiology, the urinary system, um, different types of homeostasis, including electrolyte, fluid, and acid-base balance, uh, the reproductive system, and um, inheritance. So that will be the new material that will be on the lecture exam, and then there will be some of those most missed questions from the previous two lecture exams. Um, so that study guide will be posted November 20th. It will be written in the same format as the previous study guides. The exam is on December 13th, so you have several weeks to study that study guide before the exam. Um, as a reminder, I have office hours every single Friday from 11 to 12 after your lab class. Um, so it would benefit you to stay after class and go to those and ask me questions and get going on the study guide early if you have time. Um, I need to, once I have a better idea of how long the exam is going to be and a feel for um, what you're going to need to be successful on that, I'll let you know about the timing for the final exam, whether we're going to be able to start it an hour late again um, and what, how long I'll be available to kind of review ahead of time. Um, but this is, again, the last bit of information kind of um, for the reproductive system and inheritance, and then you have about a week to work on your paper. Uh, there will also kind of be a reflection in that time, as well as um, a quiz on kind of recapping all this last bit of information. Um, then you'll have fall break, and then you'll have the lab final exam, and then the lecture final exam on December 13th. Um, on December 13th, your term paper is also due, and again, I can't take any late submissions um, because uh, grades are due on the 16th, so it has to be turned in that day. Um, sometime this week, I will get the uh, turn it in link posted so that if you get it done early, you can submit it. Also, if you get it done early, you can turn it into me first and have me proofread it to make sure that it meets the rubric. Okay, so uh, kind of learning objectives for this learning unit. Um, you need to know for both sperm and eggs, the timing and length of gametogenesis. So that's the formation of gametes, spermatogenesis for sperm and oogenesis for eggs. For spermatogenesis, you need to recognize hormonal regulation. So the role of GnRH, LH, FSH, and testosterone, as well as inhibin in regulating that process and also identify specific cells and receptors to which they bind. Um, for estrogen, specifically estradiol, uh, there's different effects when it's a moderate level versus a high level, so you need to distinguish those effects, whether they're, they're um, inhibitory or stimulatory. Uh, and then for the ovarian cycle, you should be very prepared for this for a written question, maybe specifically an essay question. Um, so thinking about negative and positive feedback involving those different hormones. So 
GnRH, LH and FSH again, as well as estrogens like estradiol and progesterone uh, during the follicular phase, during ovulation, and during the luteal phase. So being able to describe all of those different things for each of those phases during the ovarian cycle, um, also identifying key events of oogenesis, folliculogenesis, ovulation, and luteinization, and visualizing changes of the endometrium, um, specifically the functional layer during menses, proliferative and secretory phases of the menstrual cycle or uterine cycle, and relating that to hormone levels. So those three bullet points, describe, identify, and visualize, all tied together. You should also recognize why human chorionic gonadotropin is a useful indicator of pregnancy, also called HCG. Define the term bipotential gonadal tissue and connect its outcomes to the SRY gene, so again, getting into inheritance, and then connect changes in hormonal sensitivity to development in puberty. So for this chapter, chapter 27, the reproductive system, we're, um, we're not going to be covering anatomy as much as we usually do in reviewing and kind of tying it into the physiology. So if I'm mentioning stuff and you don't remember the anatomy, check out the anatomy review slides that are posted under additional study resources for this module. Um, the diagrams are the same as uh, the diagrams here. They're from our OpenStax textbook. So you can also follow along in the OpenStax textbook and check the anatomy portions there. Um, there's also some linked Khan Academy articles and videos that might be useful, um, especially for thinking about hormonal regulation. And then you are always welcome to email me if you need additional support. Um, before we get too in depth, we're going to uh, do some review as well. So I'll kind of introduce different sections that we're covering and tie in review. So one thing that I wanted to clarify is that in biology um, and in science more broadly, sometimes in textbooks they use the word gender. And I personally feel like this is not, I, I professionally feel like this is not an accurate term to use um, within the context of science. So I've alluded to this in the endocrine lecture, but I wanted to kind of revisit this. Um, I think a lot of people learn about sex chromosomes in high school or middle school biology, and they have kind of a reductive way of thinking about sexual reproductive systems. Um, so sometimes it's the case that when you have two X chromosomes, uh, you have external genitalia in the form of vulva, you have internal uterus and ovaries and fallopian tube, um, and you maybe produce low levels of testosterone, but higher levels of estrogens. Um, so maybe those things match up, but in a lot of cases, they don't. So sometimes you can have a vulva, but have different internal anatomy. Sometimes you can have chromosomes that are not XX or XY, that are XXY, which is Kleinfelter's, and X null, which is Turner's, where you only have an X chromosome and not another sex chromosome. Um, in the endocrine lecture, we talked about androgen insensitivity syndrome in which you might be XX or XY. Uh, you produce androgens, but you don't have the receptors to bind to them. Um, and so you, if you don't have receptors for something, you can't have cellular effects as a result of producing it. So it's a kind of intersex spectrum of conditions. Um, so when we're talking about biological sex, uh, specifically when we're talking about reproduction, we have a tendency to classify it as male or female. And here we're talking about kind of the alignment of different um, male anatomy and male chromosomes and male hormones and the alignment of female anatomy and female hormones and female chromosomes. Um, and so when it aligns, it might make reproduction a little bit easier. Uh, and that's kind of the uh, classical kind of model that we're going to be using today. But for a lot of your patients, that's not going to be the case. So it's important to be very specific about what you're talking about from a clinical and scientific perspective, um, and also just in terms of respecting other people. Um, ge uh, gender and pronouns don't tell you anything about what's happening with someone's anatomy. So um, make sure that you kind of distinguish those. Uh, gender is who you are. It informs your behavior, your thoughts, your identity, your pronouns. There's some evidence for a neural basis behind it, um, but gender is not what we're talking about here, we're talking about uh, gametogenesis and hormone cycles. 
Um, I also included this information in the endocrine lecture, but just as a reminder, there's some resources about androgen and sensitivity syndrome and intersex conditions. So those continue here with um, this intersex activist named Pigeon. Okay, so getting into the sections that we're covering, we're actually going to start with a brief review from Bio5, um, just to clarify some terms, and then we'll get into the physiology of the quote-unquote male reproductive system, physiology of the female reproductive system, and then development of the male and female reproductive system, so kind of um, differences in sensitivity that have to happen during puberty. So remember that gametes are haploid, meaning that they only have one set of chromosomes. So we uh, denote that with the letter N. Um, when you are diploid, we denote that with 2N, meaning you have two sets of chromosomes, but gametes are haploid, meaning they only have one set of chromosomes. And they're produced through gametogenesis or meiotic cell division or meiosis. So there's a lot of kind of redundant terms here um, that all kind of technically mean separate things, but broadly we're talking about the formation of gametes, which are sex cells or sexually reproductive cells. Um, so mitosis, or sorry, meiosis is the formation of sex cells. It's the formation of eggs or sperm, or to use more technical names, ovum or uh, spermatozoa. And when we're talking about ovum and spermatozoa, there's actually many different types of cells that come before that at different phases of meiosis. Um, and so we're going to get into kind of the technical terminology between um, oogenesis and spermatogenesis, respectively. So all of this is gametogenesis. It's the genesis or formation of gametes. They're all forms of meiotic cell division or meiosis. Um, oogenesis is the specific type of division that results in eggs, and spermatogenesis is the specific type of division that results in sperm. So when we visualize those, remember that eggs are much larger than sperm. Um, a lot of the cytosol and cellular components are coming from the egg. That's why we talk about mitochondrial DNA passing through maternal lines. Um, Sperm do have quite a lot of mitochondria, but they're not kept where the DNA is kept. They're kept in a separate part of the sperm to power the flagella. Um, and while there's some evidence of paternal leakage from mitochondrial DNA, uh, generally those mitochondria don't make it into the um, ovum and are not part of that fertilization process. Um, but these cells look very, very different and the way that they're produced is quite different as well. So when we're thinking about when mitosis happens versus when meiosis happens, um, meiosis is again the formation of gametes, so egg and sperm, um, and that is, well, in people with eggs, it's kind of starting before they're even born, and then it's frozen in place or arrested, and then it resumes after puberty. For people with sperm, it starts after puberty and continues throughout the duration of their life, um, and it's happening on a kind of cycle um, for both eggs and sperm, which we'll talk about in just a moment, um, but it's produced regularly. And then we have sperm and egg coming together for, through fertilization to create a diploid offspring or diploid zygote. Um, once you have a zygote, mitosis or identical cell uh, division um, resumes again uh, to kind of grow up and develop these complex organisms. So we go from being a single cell to being these massive complex creatures that happens through mitosis and then differentiation of different stem cell lineages. And then in our more fully formed bodies after puberty, we resume meiosis and produce haploid cells. So again, meiosis occurs in people with sperm continuously after puberty, um, with a single sperm taking about 64 or more days to produce and mature. Um, and then people with eggs, oocytes are arrested during meiosis one before these people are born. And then meiosis resumes on a 28 day ovarian cycle after puberty and continues until menopause. Also, I just want to remind you that negative feedback loops keep us in homeostasis and positive feedback loops move us away from homeostasis. Um, so positive feedback means you get more and more of something. Negative feedback means that when you have an effect, it results in the end of the stimulus. So positive out of homeostasis, negative staying in homeostasis. 
Okay, and then also last kind of bit of reminder um, in terms of hormones, when we talked about the endocrine system, we talked about uh, specific hormones from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. We also talked about hormones that are released from the ovaries as well as the testes. Um, and then we talked about uterus more in the context of um, placental hormones. So we're gonna do a quick review of some of those brain hormones, the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. So even though this is a very distant part of our body, this, uh, these different uh, endocrine structures are very important for reproductive processes. Um, so these are produced in the anterior or secreted from the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. Specifically in the hypothalamus, we have GNRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone. So that tells you what it does. It stimulates the release of gonadotropins, which include follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, which stimulates production and maturation of gametes, as well as luteinizing hormone or LH, which triggers ovulation and stimulates the release of estrogens and androgens from the ovaries and testes. FSH is also kind of indirectly responsible um, for uh, monitoring spermatogenesis. It, we usually think about it more in the context of follicles and oogenesis um, in female reproductive system, but it says gametes here more broadly because FSH is also involved indirectly in regulating spermatogenesis. Um, and so I included these visuals when we talked about the endocrine system. They will be very important for today's lecture. Okay, so as you're thinking about male and female reproductive systems, you should be focusing primarily on the timing and terminology behind gametogenesis, as well as the hormones involved in regulation. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention to these plots because you're going to be looking at them in um, the final lab that you have, so on the reproductive system. Um, so you'll be talking about the urinary system as well as the reproductive system, but in the reproductive system worksheet, you'll see some of these plots. Um, and I also want to really point out this LH surge. So right here, right before ovulation, um, and kind of look at how the baseline levels of LH are very low, and then it peaks right here. So I'm just gonna kind of put that in your mind and make sure that you're thinking about it and observe the ball, even though there's peaks around the same point for FSH and for estradiol, the baseline level is very different between those different hormones. So we're gonna be thinking a lot about hormonal regulation. Okay, so we're gonna start out by talking about the physiology of the male reproductive system. And again, if you don't remember the anatomy, look over those slides or the textbook um, or look over the Khan Academy resources. Okay, so spermatozoa are the term for fully mature sperm, and these sperm are produced in the testes. Each sperm takes about 64 days to mature, um, and so that process starts in the testes, specifically in the seminiferous tubule, and continues into the epididymis. A new cycle begins every 16 days, but that's staggered throughout different seminiferous tubules. So kind of like how in uh, the government, we don't reelect everyone all at once. It's a staggered process. One seminiferous tubule might be operating on a 16 day cycle, but the next seminiferous tubule over is working on a different 16 day cycle, beginning and ending at different times. And so you have resulting the constant production of sperm. And so that spermatogenesis process is going to begin at puberty, and then it's going to continue throughout the individual's lifetime. That being said, sperm count starts to decline after about age 35. Um, so while there's not a hard limitation to it, like there is with menopause, it does start to decline after a while, and various health effects can kind of change produce production of sperm. Also, changing levels of testosterone can lead to different cues with spermatogenesis. So when we look at the process of spermatogenesis, it starts, um, all of these kind of start with sperm, so you have an indication that they have something to do with the process of spermatogenesis. When we break down those words, spermatogenesis, sperm, and genesis, genesis is the creation of, so spermatogenesis is the overall term for the production of sperm. Spermatogonium, um, when you see that gonium, it's kind of the earlier precursor stages like oogonium or spermatogonium. 
So this is still actually a diploid cell. It hasn't gone through meiotic reduction yet. Um, and so what it's going to do first is go through mitosis and make copies of itself. So you go from having one spermatogonium to two primary spermatocytes. That's done through mitosis, so these are identical copies. And then one of those spermatocytes is going to replace the spermatogonium so that you still have these precursor cells. And then that other primary spermatocyte is going to go on through meiosis. So after meiosis, one, the uh, homologous chromosomes separate and you have two haploid cells. These are called secondary spermatocytes. Those cells are each going to divide again with the sister chromatid separating. And now you have four haploid cells after the end of meiosis two, and these are called spermatids. So even though these are haploid, they are not quite the gametes that we need them to be yet. They need to go through a process called spermiogenesis. So spermatogenesis is the overall production of sperm. Spermiogenesis is the transition from spermatid to spermatozoa, which are fully mature sperm that have that separation between the genetic contents, um, the mitochondria that power the flagella and the flagella itself. So again, those all start with sperm, but they all technically mean different things. Um, remember site, it just means cell. So uh, primary spermatocyte is like the first kind of version of a sperm cell, secondary spermatocyte, you've gone through one round of division, spermatids, you're close to being sperm, and then spermatozoa are fully mature sperm. So some important hormones for these cycles include testosterone, uh, which is really important for the development of the male reproductive system, maturation of sperm cells, to end the development of secondary sex characteristics. Testosterone can also be converted to dihydrotestosterone, which is just kind of a slightly stronger version um, that's used in different settings, like in early embryo uh, embryonic development, in uh, puberty, and in other stages. Um, it's just a little bit stronger than testosterone. There's also inhibin, which inhibits the secretion of follicle stimulating hormone, so it's indirectly involved in regulating spermatogenesis. Okay, so in thinking about um, the different hormonal cycles, um, so testosterone is secreted by the Leydig cells. Um, so we think about testosterone as being the male uh, or main male androgen. Um, and so it's secreted by Leydig cells, but it also comes from a few different sources. So we'll talk kind of about broadly the role of testosterone and then get into some of those regulatory pathways. So every day, um, about six to seven milligrams per day is produced, and then most of that is concentrated in the testes and involved in spermatogenesis. Um, so it's concentrated there, but it also enters into circulation, and that's important for anabolic processes like muscle and bone growth, for the development of secondary sex characteristics, specifically after puberty, um, and then for regulating libido. Uh, so it's important to enter circulation for those reasons. Also, when it's in circulation, um, it's able to play a role in feedback loops, um, which we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, testosterone is also secreted by the adrenal glands and then by the ovaries as well. So while we think about testosterone as being a male sex hormone, it's found in all kinds of bodies. So when we're thinking about those androgen feedback loops, we're primarily thinking about GnRH, FSH, LH, testosterone, and inhibin, and thinking about which ones bind to Leydig cells or interstitial cells versus Sertoli cells. So when GnRH stimulates the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH, LH binds to Leydig cells, those interstitial cells, and it encourages and stimulates the production of testosterone. So you have LH uh, then resulting in the production of more testosterone. FSH is binding to Sertoli cells, so it's binding to a different set of cells, um, and it promotes spermatogenesis. However, once you have a certain level of spermatogenesis, um, that results in the production of inhibins. So you have a negative feedback loop established where you have GnRH stimulating FSH, FSH 
helping to promote spermatogenesis kind of indirectly, um, but then also resulting in the production of inhibins and creating a negative feedback loop where you don't have GnRH and FSH being produced as much. Um, testosterone is produced after stimulation from LH binding to Leydig cells. Um, so it can enter circulation and like I mentioned, create a negative feedback loop by binding to receptors on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. So if testosterone levels in circulation get very high, then it binds to those different structures and stops production of GnRH and LH which then indirectly stops production of itself. So that's a negative feedback loop, keeping us in homeostasis. Um, and then it also binds to androgen binding protein, which is released from Sertoli cells. So FSH is involved in binding to those Sertoli cells and helping to produce those androgen binding proteins. Um, androgen binding should tell you that it's binding to androgens and that they're proteins. And so those bind to testosterone and keep testosterone maintained at very high concentrations in the testes um, and it kind of maintains them so that you can have these accurate feedback loops. Okay, so that was a very kind of simple feedback loop. Um, the ovarian cycle and the corresponding uterine or menstrual cycle are much more complicated. So we're going to spend a lot more time on that. Um, so when we're thinking about oocytes, these uh, egg cells or premature egg cells mature in the ovaries. Um, so oogonia are those ovarian stem cells, the precursor cells. And those undergo meiosis before people with eggs are even born. So they undergo part of meiosis, but not the full thing. They start meiosis one and then are, are rested at a certain phase of that. Um, and so we have these kind of primary oocytes starting to be formed during fetal development. Um, so before you're even born. And then when you uh, kind of get further along, then you have the end of meiosis one, meiosis two, and maturation of oocytes happening roughly every 28 days. So that ovarian cycle um, after puberty and then stopping at, at, men at, at, sorry, at menopause. Um, and then it's interesting because the culmination of meiosis actually happens immediately after fertilization. So you don't even have a fully matured ovum until fertilization occurs. Um, so we're going to think about kind of the development of the follicle, the development of the egg, the changing nature of the uterus, and how all of that ties together. Another thing I want to point out here is that on this uh, ovary, which is this whole structure, this is a histological slide, we see one follicle right here. So this big circle is a developed follicle. Um, we can tell that it's a tertiary follicle or a really well-developed follicle by the presence of this fluid, the antrum in the center. Um, we see the zona pellicula, which is really important for um, per, uh, kind of those processes that help prevent polyspermy and interaction with the sperm. Um, and so we see this developed oocyte right here. But we also see other follicles that are starting to develop. So we see those in different places um, at different levels of development. And so we're going to get into kind of the hormonal cues that encourage development at different rates um, and think about that in follicular genesis. So before we get into that, remember that GnRH, FSH, and LH are very important here as well, as well as estrogens, which include estradiol, which we'll talk quite a bit about, estriol and estrone. Um, estrogens are involved in the development of the female reproductive system in regulating the, uh, the uterine or menstrual cycles, as well as the ovarian cycle, and the development of secondary sex characteristics. Um, these are secreted from follicles, so keep that in mind. Progesterone is called the pregnancy hormone, and it's uh, kind of correlated with the second uh, larger phase or luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. Um, and so this is important for regulating the ovarian and uh, uterine cycles and preparing the body for and maintaining pregnancy. So we're going to kind of look at scenarios in which pregnancy does not occur, but keep in mind that if pregnancy does occur, progesterone levels remain high and they create an environment that's very healthy for the developing fetus.
Um, another thing that estrogens are involved in are regulation of fluid and electrolyte balance, which we talked quite a bit about last week, as well as stimulation of protein synthesis. So another thing that I want to kind of point out is that estrogen has different effects depending on the level of estrogen that you have. Um, and the way that we classify that level changes transitioning from childhood through puberty. So we'll talk about how during puberty you become less sensitive so that you can have more estrogen, um, more of these different sex hormones, um, and have kind of a new baseline. Um, so the level of estrogen matters when you have moderate or low levels of estrogen, it has an inhibitory effect. So it inhibits GnRH release, which then inhibits secretion of LH and FSH. But when you have very high levels of estrogen, that actually stimulates gonadotropin-releasing hormone, um, which then stimulates secretion of LH and FSH. So when you have low levels of estrogen, it inhibits. When you have higher levels of estrogen, it actually stimulates. So inhibin is also produced in these bodies as well, which again inhibits secretion of GnRH and FSH, this time towards the end of the uterine cycle, and relaxin, which is involved in delivery, it relaxes the pubis symphysis. Um, my computer, I guess, uh, corrected that to pubics instead of pubis, but the pubis symphysis, and then also it is involved in dilation of the cervix. Okay, so I wanted to first uh, kind of talk through the general phases of the ovarian cycle in words so that you have them written out. And then the next slide has them in images from the OpenStax textbook. So we'll go through it, just kind of introducing some terms and cueing you into some stuff that will happen with the uterine cycle um, and follicular genesis, and then we'll get into kind of visuals. So the ovarian cycle is related to the uterine cycle, but kind of slightly different. Um, it's thinking primarily about eggs and follicles rather than the uterus. So we divide it into three general stages. There's the follicular phase, which should make you think about the development of follicles. There's ovulation, which should make you think about the release of an egg. And there's the luteal phase, which if you're remembering anatomy, should make you think about the corpus luteum. So in the follicular phase, um, well, for each of these phases, we have stuff happening in the pituitary and stuff happening around the ovaries. So I'll go through each of those locations for each phase. In the follicular phase, you have LH and FSH being released from the pituitary. Um, and so those are going to act on the follicles in the ovary and stimulate a few follicles at a time. So of those different follicles, one of them is considered dominant, um, which means it has kind of the right conditions of hormones and uh, granulosa cells um, and kind of different conditions to make it the main follicle. So even though you have a few follicles maturing at this point in time, one of those is going to be the dominant follicle that's actually going to release an egg. Um, so the, that dominant follicle is starting to produce estradiol and estrogen. And as it develops, you have more and more estrogen, estradiol being produced. But initially, in early follicular phase, there's not much. And remember, when you have low levels of estrogen, low levels of estradiol, it's inhibitory. So you had LH and FSH produced, but now you have estradiol inhibiting more production. Um, so it inhibits GnRH, which inhibits LH and FSH. And estradiol is also involved in thickening the endometrium, specifically the functional layer. Um, but again, that's more related to the uterine cycle. During ovulation, you have LH and FSH stimulating follicle maturation. Um, and so uh, those are being released from the pituitary. Um, in the ovaries, you have estradiol being produced much uh, more heavily because you have a more developed follicle. Um, remember, the follicle is what's producing the estradiol, and so now you have a lot more of it to the point where now, instead of being inhibitory, it's stimulatory. It's giving positive feedback and stimulating GnRH and LH and FSH. 
So you get what's called an LH surge, where LH has been relatively low until this point, even though it was maybe stimulated in a few places, it's still a kind of lower baseline, but you have this LH surge that's really going to trigger oogenesis and ovulation. So we'll talk about kind of how it causes the release of the egg from the follicle when we get into folliculogenesis. After the egg is released, that follicle is then going to start to change and become an endocrine structure. So you have um, LH stimulating the formation of what's called the corpus luteum. That's uh, formerly the follicle, but now it's the corpus luteum. And I'll get into why it's called that in just a moment. Um, but that is producing progesterone, um, and that corpus luteum is inhibiting GnRH, LH, and FSH, um, but helping to maintain the endometrium uh, and keep it developed and vascularized. Um, but after about 10 to 12 days, if the uh, if fertilization and implantation have not occurred, the corpus luteum is going to degrade and the ovarian cycle is going to start over again. So this lines up fairly well with the uterine cycle, which we'll talk about in just a moment, um, but it's not perfectly a one-to-one -one relationship. So again, I mentioned that that was verbal. Now we're getting into some visuals. So in the follicular phase, you have GnRH stimulating the anterior pituitary to produce FSH and LH. Those are acting on the follicles in the ovaries. Um, and as the follicles start to mature, just a few of them at a time, you have low levels of estradiol being produced. At those low, low levels, it's inhibitory, so it's inhibiting more release of GnRH, FSH, and LH, um, but it's also causing the endometrium to start to thicken. So you have the development of the endometrium. During ovulation, you have an LH surge, you have more FSH, um, and you have uh, tons of estradiol being produced from those developed follicles, which is what's causing that LH surge because it's now to the point where it's having a stimulatory effect, a positive effect rather than an inhibitory effect. So you have lots of estradiol, you have that LH surge, you have the endometrium really being fully developed and being at a good spot for implantation. And then during the luteal phase, um, you have the formation of the corpus luteum, which is producing progesterone now. Um, so rather than estradiol, you have progesterone, the pregnancy hormone, so trying to create a healthy environment for pregnancy. Um, so it's maintaining the endometrium, but again, as the corpus luteum starts to degrade, if pregnancy does not happen, that's going to change the levels of progesterone and you're going to start sloughing off um, part of the endometrium, the functional layer or stratum functionalis, but again, that's part of the uterine cycle. And then this process will start over again. So when we're thinking about the different things that are happening during the ovarian cycle, one of those really key things is oogenesis, the production of eggs. And we see some similar terms that we saw when we were talking about spermatogenesis. We have the stem cell, that's the oogonium, um, and then we have that process of mitosis happening to replace the oogonium during early development. So that's happening um, when you're a fetus. Meiosis is going to begin. You have um, kind of transitioning through meiosis one, um, but it's going to stop during prophase one. So the first part of meiosis happens before birth, but then it's going to resume during puberty. So oogenesis is a type of gametogenesis. I'm sorry, gametogenesis. There's a lot of G's and E's in that word um, that's producing eggs. But when we say egg, that can mean a lot of different things. So when you're early um, in development, when you are an infant, you have anywhere from one to two million oocytes. Um, at about puberty, it gets down to 400,000. And by the end, um, towards menopause, uh, you have zero. Remember that the LH surge is what's responsible for resuming meiosis. So a lot of that follicular phase is really just the progress and development of the follicle. It's follicular genesis. Um, oogenesis is happening kind of at the very end of the follicular phase right before ovulation. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship of oogenesis and follicular genesis. 
Um, and as you have this process continuing, remember meiosis has meiosis one and meiosis two. When you get to metaphase two, the oocyte is gonna stop, it's going to arrest meiosis, and it's not going to continue again until fertilization actually occurs. Um, and so meiosis two completes immediately after the sperm penetrates the oocyte. So to back up, when we talked about spermatogenesis, one spermagonium, sorry, spermatogonium, one sperm stem cell resulted in four fully developed spermatozoa or fully mature sperm cells. But here we see that one oogonium only results in one mature ovum. Um, so remember, eggs are very large cells. They require a lot of cellular components, um, some you're able to actually see with your naked eye. So they are very large, very energy intensive cells. Um, so the other three cells that result um, are what we call polar bodies. They're much more reduced in size. Um, and so they don't result in mature ova. Um, so we have one oogonium resulting in um, at most one mature ovum and three polar bodies that don't become ova. Okay, and in thinking about follicular genesis, we have um, kind of a similar sequential series of developments. Uh, so we have a, a follicle that has a, usually a single primary oocyte inside of it, um, and it also has a lot of support cells. So initially, that's mostly granulosa cells, um, but then over time, we start to get more connective tissue, we start to get blood vessels, as well as theca cells. So in early development and throughout most of our life, most of our follicles are what we call primordial follicles. So that's primordial before order or before development. Um, so these are the most common ones. And we see those right here where it's mostly just the granulosa cells and some cortex cells around the primary oocyte. Um, as we go through follicular phase and follicular genesis, um, we have primary follicles and secondary follicles, which are immature, but are recruited a few at a time to develop further. Um, and we start to see those theca cells, we start to see the zona pellicula and a lot more development and a lot more granulosa cells as well. Dominant follicle progresses to that, or a few follicles at a time get to that tertiary phase, but the dominant one is the one that's actually going to be releasing the oocyte. Um, so several follicles might release tertiary stage at the same time, but most of them undergo what's called atresia, um, which is follicular death. So only the dominant follicle is going to be releasing the oocyte. So that LH surge um, that is really stimulating the development of the oocyte and producing the um, the mature egg is equally important for getting the egg out of the follicle. Um, so we have that LH surge, it stimulates ovulation, it stimulates meiosis, and it also produces proteases. So proteases then go in and help rupture the follicle and help open it up so that it's able to release the oocyte. So even the breakdown of the follicle is tied to that LH surge. After that, the ruptured follicle transitions into the corpus luteum, which becomes an endocrine structure. Ovulation is again a, the release of a oocyte from a follicle on the ovary. And uh, luteinization is that transformation of the follicle into the corpus luteum. Um, so when you uh, take microbiology. I know a lot of you are taking it right now, but uh, so some of you might take it later. When you do take microbiology, you'll probably work with an organism called Micrococcus luteus, which turns a really bright yellow color in certain conditions. Um, and so luteus means yellow. Corpus, if you think about corpse, that's a body. So corpus luteum is yellow body. And um, in certain conditions, not in this preserved structure, but it actually does have a yellowish color to it. Um, and it's really important because it secretes progesterone. So it helps get the uterus ready for implantation. Um, if 
pregnancy doesn't happen. If you don't have implantation, then it starts to degrade. Um, it becomes what's called the corpus albicans. So you might think about Canada albicans, a type of yeast uh, that has a white appearance. Albicans means white. You might also think about albino uh, if you're not a huge micro nerd um, and just like a normal person. Um, so albino, thinking about white, so it goes from corpus luteum to corpus albicans, and it degrades and gets reintegrated into your body. So again, progesterone is really important for reestablishing negative feedback. Remember that high levels of estradiol cause positive feedback, but now progesterone is establishing negative feedback. Um, and so you have no more stimulation of follicles. You've already released an egg. You have a corpus luteum. So the process kind of slows in terms of follicular genesis until the cycle starts over again. Um, that being said, there is kind of a crazy thing that happens where you have uh, twins that are different ages. So this happens when you don't have sufficient suppression of this uh, kind of feedback loop and you release an egg that ends up fertilized later in pregnancy. So even being pregnant is not a um, fully effective form of birth control. You can actually you can actually get pregnant again um, if you go through follicular genesis and oogenesis and release an egg. Uh, so it can be very dangerous because now you have two embryos, two fetuses at different stages of development, but if they are sufficiently close in age, um, when you go into labor or have an emergency or scheduled C-section, they can be removed at the same time. One of them is closer to being fully full term, the other one is premature. So pregnancy and childbirth is wild and you can actually have twins that are different ages. Um, I talked about the corpus albicans and how that degrades. Okay, so that was the ovarian cycle and then we also have the uterine cycle. So the uterine cycle focuses on the uterus, specifically what's happening to the stratum functionalis or the functional layer of the endometrium. Remember that there's a basal layer of the endometrium that remains consistent and in place and anchors it um, that is not growing and shedding. So the uterine cycle or menstrual cycle is divided into menses, which is what we consider menstruation. There's the proliferative phase where the endometrium is proliferating and the secretory phase, um, which is that last phase that we'll talk about in just a moment. So when we're talking about menses, that's happening at the beginning of the follicular phase. So it times up about that point. Um, it lasts anywhere from two to seven or more days, but it's very different for different people. So that's just an average. It might happen on a 28 day cycle. It could happen with much more time in between. But at this point, the stratum functionalis of the endometrium is shedding. After it sheds, you get into proliferative phase where the endometrium is proliferating and growing again. And this times up kind of with um, the end of follicular genesis, with fuller development of the follicles and release of estradiol uh, to help grow up that endometrium again. This lasts for about seven days and it's late follicular phase until ovulation. And then as you get into luteal phase, you have the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. This is where progesterone stimulates um, the endometrium. So you have uh, much more thickening, you have glands secreting glycogen to provide a lot of um, sugar and, and different resources for the egg. And then you have vascularization occurring as well. So you have adequate blood flow into this tissue. Um, so this lasts for 10 to 12 to 14 days, the luteal phase. But if pregnancy doesn't happen, then you have a return to menses. So the corpus luteum degrades, it stops producing progesterone and you get back into menses. So when we're looking at this all together, um, this diagram is showing up here at the top, the ovarian cycles, and then down here, it's showing the uterine cycle. So you can kind of keep track of that. Remember that as you have the follicle developing, it's producing estrogen, estradiol, which is encouraging um, the proliferative phase to occur. You have ovulation occurring and then possibly implantation if fertilization occurs. So you have the secretory phase getting the uterus really ready for implantation.
Um, so this diagram is showing something similar. I would recommend studying the previous diagram quite a bit. This one is really cool looking and visually appealing, but it might be really challenging for you to read. So just to summarize, um, menstruation or menses is the shedding of the uterine lining, the endometrium. The follicular phase is helping to get the egg ready. So GnRH is causing LH and FSH to increase and several follicles grow. Ovulation is the release of the egg. So LH and FSH, you really have one follicle that's a dominant follicle. Um, you have LH surge and estradiol is maintaining a positive feedback loop now. You have the luteal phase, which is getting the uterus ready um, and the corpus luteum developing in the ovaries and secreting progesterone, the pre pregnancy hormone. Um, at this point, you can either have pregnancy or you can return to menstruation and menses. So if pregnancy does occur and proceeds, then you have the development of a completely new organ called the placenta, um, which is a organ of the developing offspring. So it has their DNA, um, not just your DNA. Um, and it's really important because it also secretes hormones. So the placenta specifically produces human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG, um, and that's detectable using pregnancy test kits. So hypothetically or theoretically, it's only secreted by the placenta, but there's some cancers um, associated with the male reproductive system that also produce HCG. Um, so it's released by the placenta to maintain that and, um, endometrium, the uterine lining, and also to reduce the response of the maternal immune system to this basically endoparasite or foreign invader, this different person inside of your body. Um, and the placenta is also responsible for secreting estrogens and progesterone. But HCG is a useful hormone uh, to detect pregnancy because it's usually just secreted when you have pregnancy. Okay, so finally getting into puberty um, and also kind of development before puberty, so tying together with inheritance. Um, so if we did not have specific chemical cues uh, that are coming from genes on the Y chromosome, all fertilized eggs would develop as females. And those chemical cues come from this gene called SRY, which stands for sex determining region of the Y chromosome. Um, so this gene is found on the Y chromosome. Um, it's pictured here as, as being made up of two chromatids. So this is after synthesis. Um, and so this gene, um, when you have active expression of this gene during development, it causes a signaling cascade, a chemical response that results in male development. So you either have SRY activation when you have the Y chromosome or you don't have the Y chromosome and you don't have SRY activation, um, kind of in the simplest scenario. So before SRY activation, you have gonadal tissue that's considered bipotential. Remember, potential means that it can become something, bi means two. So this gonadal tissue can either become testes or ovaries. If there's no SRY activation or minus SRY, um, it becomes ovaries. If there is SRY activation plus SRY, it becomes testes. So it's a bipotential gonad, but then after flipping that switch, after activating that gene and expressing that chemical cascade, if you have the SRY gene, you end up with testes. If you do not have the SRY gene, you end up with ovaries. And remember that gene is sex linked, it's on the Y chromosome, so it's affiliated with the presence of a Y chromosome. So the release of testosterone from the Leydig cells is critical for this process. So in terms of testicular development, um, and so when you don't have the SRY gene, you don't have testosterone being um, released from the Leydig cells. Um, and so externally, if you don't have testosterone, if you are minus SRY, um, a certain set of cells will differentiate into the clitoris, the glans clitoris. The analogous structure for that is the gland's penis. So when you do have the SRY gene on the white chromosome and it is activated and you do have testosterone, those cells instead differentiate into the gland's penis. 
So we had that bipotential gonadal tissue. We have these cells that might differentiate into the clitoris or the glans penis. Um, and then internally, you have two different ductal systems that are forming things like the epididymis, the vas deferens, um, or things like the fallopian tubes and the uterus. So in females, quote unquote, um, the Mullerian duct develops um, and the Wolfian duct degrades. The Wolfian duct is associated with male anatomy. When uh, you do have testosterone, when you do have the SRY gene, the Wolfian duct develops and the Mullerian duct degrades. So you start out with both of those and then the activation or inactivation of the SRY gene and production or no production of testosterone is what results in one of them developing and the other degrading. Okay, so then finally, thinking about getting into puberty after early life development, um, there are some changes in our body in terms of sensitivity to hormones. Um, so remember that we can add or remove receptors to change sensitivity. Um, and so we actually decrease our sensitivity in the hypothalamus and pituitary to negative feedback. Um, so it takes more and more sex steroid hormones like estrogens and androgens to stop that production of gonadotropins. So you have kind of a higher baseline of these hormones in your body. Um, so it takes kind of more and more of them to stop production of gonadotropins. Um, you also have an increased sensitivity in the gonads to those FSH and LH signals. And these changes lead to higher levels of gonadotropins overall, enlargement and maturation of gonads, and secretion of sex hormones and initiation of gametogenesis. Um, so that sums up this lecture. I will get the inheritance slides and lecture posted within a couple days. Um, and then this is, again, the last kind of learning unit overall for the lecture exam. Um, there will be a quiz uh, ranging from the homeostasis lecture through reproduction and inheritance uh, posted in the coming weeks.